Welcome to Board Game Casual. Now, a while back, I posted a video where I thought it would be fun to look back at the first five board games I played after being a long time Settlers of Catan player and look at how these games helped me evolve into the broader world of board games. In that video, I shared my thoughts on how I felt about each game then and how I feel about them now, several years later. If you haven't watched that video yet, I recommend going and watching it first because this video is essentially part two, where I'll look back at the next five games, games six through 10, I played after those five. While the majority of the first five were all great games, there's not a lot that I still play today. Will these next five prove to have more staying power? Let's find out. Okay, so to set the stage at this point in time, what used to be Catan Nights have now become Game Nights. We were actively playing games like Dominion, Caverna, King of Tokyo, and more importantly, it was a time that was like an avalanche of discovering new games and buying all these different games to try. One thing I felt like I was missing, though, was a game for a higher player count. I had almost always played Catan at six players, and always wished I could play with more people. Even though the long time between turns in a six-player game could drag on, I just liked having more people at the table. A lot of these new games I was playing, however, seemed to cap out at four players, so I started researching the best games for six or more, and I pulled the trigger on a copy of the highly recommended game Seven Wonders, which makes the sixth game I played after Catan. What really sold me on this game is that it could play up to seven players, and it was the first game where I learned about simultaneous gameplay. In Seven Wonders, every player is essentially taking their turn, doing their action at the same time. This means there's almost no downtime in the game, and playing with seven players plays just as fast as playing with three. This was pretty mind-blowing since I was used to playing games where you're going around the table, waiting for each person to take their turn before you can take yours. There was another reason I got Seven Wonders, though. I thought that this would make a good precursor to a different game that I had my eye on. I figured Seven Wonders would be a great introduction to the card drafting mechanism. Around this time, Blood Rage was all the rage, and it was being talked about everywhere. It had a ton of hype, was at the top of everyone's lists, and I thought it looked really cool. I liked the theme, and I was thinking it would be my first game with really cool minis. That said, Blood Rage was also totally different than anything my friends and I were playing. I knew it might be a tough sell to my girlfriend, for example. It had a lot of mechanics we weren't familiar with, and as I learned about how card drafting is one of the main mechanisms in Blood Rage, I thought it would be good to get familiar with the concept through Seven Wonders first. Now, spoiler alert, although I bought Blood Rage shortly after, it sat unopened on my shelf for a long time before I was able to get it to the table. So you're not gonna see Blood Rage on this list. Coming back to Seven Wonders, I like this game, but for me, it seemed to wear out pretty fast. I like how you're focused on your own player board and being able to trade and score with the player directly to your right and directly to your left without having to negotiate. I like the feeling of the progression in the game, getting more powerful as your tableau builds and seeing more powerful cards come out each round. I like that there were different ways to score and yet, not so many ways that they were hard to remember when putting together a strategy. But honestly, I just got tired with Seven Wonders pretty quick. The novelty of this game for me really is how quickly it plays at such a higher player count. And Seven Wonders quickly became the game for specifically when we were in a group of six or more and likely seven people. Any fewer and there were just so many other games I'd rather play instead. Fast forward to today and I've still got Seven Wonders on the shelf, but I couldn't tell you the last time I played it. I think I was even gifted an expansion for it years ago that I've never played. It's a good game, I would certainly be more than happy to to play Seven Wonders if someone else wanted to, but it's no longer my go-to for big groups. I'd much rather play something like Camel Up, Ready, Set, Bet, or Long Shot the Dice Game. The seventh game I played after Catan was at my buddy Andrew's house, where he had picked up the game Splendor, and oh man, did I 
instantly jive with this game. This was the only other game since Dominion where just in a couple of turns, I immediately was like, wow, this game is good. Splendor just clicked with that part of my brain. It has such a great progression of feeling rich and powerful. I love those turns where you can just pick up a card without spending any tokens because your tableau is making more than enough jewels to buy it. Fast forward to today, and I still play Splendor regularly. It's one of my top board games of all time, if not the top. My girlfriend loves Splendor maybe even more than I do. It's definitely a comfort game for us. Setup is super quick, and we can play a few games while having a conversation. Splendor became one of my go-tos to introduce new board gamers to, and even as my go-to gift for people as a present or like a white elephant entry. I'm also really excited because I was recently gifted the new Splendor Duel, a two-player game, and I just can't wait to try that one out. The eighth game I played after Catan was Betrayal at House on the Hill. My buddy Andrew picked up this game and brought it over. I was excited to play it because I had always seen it in the greatest of all time lists and in a video where Sung Won Cho, Pro ZD on YouTube, talked about how much he liked the game. And we had yet to play this type of story-based, RPG, dungeon crawlery-esque kind of game. I was also really excited to see that the game came with painted minis. Unfortunately though, our play was one of the worst game experiences I've ever had. We were all learning it for the first time, so up front, getting through the rule book was a bit painstaking. And once we finally got started playing, the story turns seemed to trigger really early. We only opened up maybe two or three rooms and they were all rooms that only had one or two exits to them and a lot of dead ends. In our story, one of the main characters turned into a blob monster that was growing rapidly engulfing all the rooms. And within one turn each, we were all dead. There was nowhere to run and we didn't have any kind of items to slow it down or fight it off. The whole thing felt so pointless and we barely got to do anything after spending so much time going through the rule book and setup. It just felt broken. To be fair, I've heard there are so many combinations of events and timing and variations of how things play out that sometimes you can just get dealt a really bad campaign that doesn't quite work. So I'm sure we just got unlucky with our play. Someday I'd like to give it another fair shake and see if I like it, but honestly, it just left such a bad taste in our mouths. And there were so many other new games to try that we never had a desire to come back to it. I'm also not sure that these types of games that have to be driven or DM'd by kind of one of the players is the kind of game my friends and I like to play anyway. The ninth game I played after Catan was another game I picked up after seeing it recommended in a few Dice Tower videos, including Tom Vassell's top board games of all time list, Roll for the Galaxy, where, at least at the time, he talked about how much more he enjoys this game to its predecessor, Race for the Galaxy. This game has a ton of custom dice, and I really like dice mitigation in games, especially where you can beef up the odds by acquiring more dice and choosing the types of dice you want based on their probabilities for rolling certain symbols. The fact that this game could play up to five and was another game that had a lot of simultaneous play was another selling point for me. This was the first game I played that had privacy screens for each player, where every player is secretly betting by placing their dice and then everyone reveals at the same time to resolve the actions and turn order. I remember that learning the game was a bit of a challenge. This game has a ton of rules, iconography, and terminology, especially having never played Race for the Galaxy or any other game like like this where you have this very specific chain of actions that you have to follow and how sometimes the dice represent your workers and other times they represent a product etc it took a while to understand my girlfriend and I definitely made some mistakes on our first play but once we got it straightened out man what a great game there's this exciting kind of low stakes betting aspect of the game looking at your opponent's boards and trying to guess what actions everyone else is going to trigger that you can then piggyback on for free there's bag pull there's engine building, there's different ways to score points, and I really like that this game is a race rather than a set number of rounds. I love Roll for the Galaxy to this day. It's a great game. It's one of my girlfriend's favorites, and I think
think it still feels fresh. Even though it's been a while since I've pulled it out, it's a game that's always on my mind to get to the table. The only thing that really keeps it from coming out more is that I dread having to teach it. If I'm with people who don't play a lot of board games, for example, it's so much easier to teach something like Space Base, and you can be on the ground running right away. And the 10th game I played after Catan was Mystic Veil. I think this was my first game from John D. Clare, who has slowly become my favorite game designer. This game takes Dominion and that deck building mechanism I like so much and brings it a step further with card crafting. In Mystic Veil, you are actually building the cards that you're playing as part of your deck. The game comes with these clear sleeves and transparent card inserts that can be stacked inside the sleeve to form your card. So not only are you building your deck, but you're building the actual cards. I love building things in general, whether it's in board games or the real world. So having this game where you can mix and match your own inserts to form custom cards is so much fun to me. Do I wanna spread the powers out so that I'm more likely to draw something? Do I wanna make a jack of all trades card that can do a little bit of everything? Do I wanna make a card that's super heavy on income or a particular resource? Do I wanna make a card that lets me keep drawing cards without busting? Or do I wanna make a card that's straight points? You have a ton of freedom in this game. Mystic Veil also has a really fun push your luck aspect to it too, which I don't see in a lot of deck builders. Basically, you draw cards one at a time and you can continue to draw as many as you want into your hand. However, once you hit three strike symbols, you bust. Now you can't play any of the cards from your hand, but you do get a compensation bonus that can be used later. So there's this fun aspect of, do I push for one more card or do I make the most of what I have in front of me? This is a great, great game. Which of these five games am I still actively playing today? Without a doubt, Splendor. My girlfriend loves it, I love teaching it to new people, and this game makes it to the table a ton. To be totally honest, it's been a while since I've played Roll for the Galaxy or Mystic Veil, vale, but they are both always in my mind as games I actively want to play and options for a game night. They just usually get bumped in favor of playing something new. Which of these games, if any, would I actively recommend or not recommend today? The hardest game for me to recommend from this list would be Betrayal at House on the Hill. Now, I don't want to be too hard on it, being that I only had one unfortunate play. This is a well-revered game by many, it's very popular, and I understand that sometimes there's a risk of the scenario just not working out. But at the same time, the fact that you can end up in a scenario that doesn't work that's hard to ignore and just something to be mindful of. And even with the bad scenario side, as I mentioned, this game just doesn't really align with my tastes. On the flip side, I'd easily recommend Splendor if you wanted an elegant engine building game, Mystic Veil vale if you like deck building and want to try out card crafting, and Roll for the Galaxy if you like tableau building, bag pulling, dice mitigation, and a betting mechanism where you're trying to get into your opponent's heads. Which of these games would I be most excited to play right now if someone else wanted to? Right now, I think I would say Roll for the Galaxy with Mystic Veil vale as a close second. I already play Splendor a lot. While Roll for the Galaxy is always on the back of my mind, relearning and teaching it always feels like a hurdle. So if someone actively wanted to play, I think I'd be pretty excited and that would be the perfect motivation to dive back in. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the second five board games, games six through 10, I played after branching out from playing nothing but Settlers of Catan. I was really glad to see some evergreens in this list compared to the first five. Will there be a part three? Hard to say. While I was able to go back through my purchase history and talking with friends to remember the first 10, Honestly, that point onward, things get a little fuzzy. We were just playing so many new games, it's hard to remember the order. So I might need to figure out a different way to make videos about looking back at older games and what I think of them now. If you've played any of the games from this video, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. What's your favorite of these five? Which of these do you still play regularly today? Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for liking and subscribing. And I'll see you next time here on Board Game Casual.